Good evening. My name is Mofei Shayo Ayodele, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum and College Relations, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program, Human Rights, an Analysis of Saudi Arabia and the Impact of Islam. In his book, The Clash of Civilizations, author and political scientist Samuel Huntington posits that religious and cultural ideologies will be the defining characteristics of conflict in the post-Cold War era. Perceived conflicts between Islamic religion and Western culture have characterized much of this period and in many ways fulfilled the prophecies of Huntington. Events like 9-11 have exacerbated these pre-existing tensions within, the, within this contentious relationship. The most litigious issue between the two cultures, however, is human rights. Islam often dictates a view seemingly opposed to the Western view of certain human rights, especially with regard to religious and political freedoms and minority rights. Tonight, Anthony Bonanno will use Saudi Arabia to analyze the impact of Islam on human rights. Anthony Bonanno is a qualified U.S. partner at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher. His area of concentration, international taxation, focuses on many areas, including structuring of business activities throughout Europe, the Middle East, and the United States, as well as taxation of U.S. businesses and individuals abroad. Mr. Bonanno primarily advises Middle Eastern clients, including Islamic Arab financial institutions, on their worldwide investments. He also spent time in Washington, D.C., where he was an adjunct professor of law at the Georgetown University Law School. Currently, he teaches international tax at Notre Dame University's Law School London branch. Mr. Bonanno lectured Dickinson students on this very topic of human rights in Bologna. A 1968 graduate of Dickinson, he is returning as a Metzger Conway Fellow. The Metzger Conway program was established at Dickinson in 1982. Originally designed as a program for bringing distinguished female graduates back to the college, the program was expanded in 1987 to include both men and women of distinction. The goal of the Metzger Conway program is to provide Dickinson students with role models and to enrich the curriculum. At this time, I would like to ask that you turn off all cell phones and electronic devices. Please hold all questions until the question and answer session at the end of the program. Because this event is being taped and some audience members may be hearing impaired, please wait until the microphone has been brought to you before beginning to speak. Now please join me in welcoming Mr. Anthony Bonanno. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, it's funny you mentioned Samuel Huntington. We didn't co coordinate about that. I'm going to be talking a little about uh, the clash of civilization in, in my presentation. And I think it, it lent, that book lends itself to uh, the topic of, of Saudi Arabia uh, and how Islam has, has, has affected uh, human rights in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, I want to thank Harry for inviting me here. Um, uh, Dickinson is special to me. I was here from 1964 to 68. I spent 66 and 67 in Bologna in the Bologna program that Dickinson has been running. I guess I was there, it was, it was the second year that, that it was run. And it was just a wonderful year. It changed my life. Uh, it made me want to do international work. And uh, after Bologna, coming back to Carlisle, uh, was also a, a good experience for me. And uh, unfortunately, 1968, it was the Vietnam War, so I was going to be drafted. And rather than being drafted, I enlisted in the U.S. Army. Do we have any war college people here? Good. And um, I ended up going to Fort Hollerbird. I'm not sure if it still exists in Baltimore in, in military intelligence. And I ended up being stationed in Vicenza in northern Italy. The, uh, city near, near, near Venice. And that was all because of Dickinson, because of Bologna, be learning some Italian when I spent there. So I spent two and a half years uh, in military intelligence, very interesting experience. Again, Dickinson helped me in that. I was an interpreter in polygraph machine uh, uh, exams, which was very interesting with the CIA. I was undercover for, for, for about two and a half years with different personalities and different passports and all that, traveled all over Europe. 
And this is a 23, 24-year-old kid traveling around. So uh, when people talk about not wanting to go into the U.S. Army or to the military and, uh, and saying how lucky, you know, Bill Clinton missing out and uh, President Bush missing out in the military, I say to people that they, they've really missed out because the experience uh, I got in the military and being in Vicenza was, was, was tremendous. And again, a lot of that is, it has to do with, with, uh, with, with, with uh, Dickinson. Um, now the topic was human rights and human rights in Saudi Arabia and the impact of Islam. When Harry mentioned uh, the, the, uh, the Clark Forum and mentioned the topic of human rights, I said to Harry, I said, Harry, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of human rights, but what do I know about human rights? He says, well, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, you know about that. You go, you know, you go there, you should be able to say something, something about that. So a few, a few disclaimers here. You know, number one, I'm not an academic. Um, I've traveled the Middle East for 30 years, particularly Saudi Arabia, but Bahrain, Kuwait, the UAE, I'm very, very familiar with, with that area. But I'm not an academic and I haven't really studied, studied the area. It's really the perspective of, of, of a layman working out there. Uh, I'm not a human rights activist, uh, never really studied human rights. I'm all for, for, for human rights. Uh, but this topic got me to think about human rights in, in Saudi Arabia and giving that, that presentation. Uh, I'm not a Muslim, but I'm very familiar with Islam. Uh, one of the things you learn very, very quickly, particularly in Saudi Arabia, and I want to focus on Saudi Arabia as opposed to Egypt or the Levantine or the Maghreb, um, religion is, is, is paramount in, in, in the way they look at life. It, it is it's such an alien culture in a sense for us here in the West where we've become very secular. And uh, so, and, and, and they're constantly talking about it. And I actually, I think I've learned a lot o over many years about what, what Islam is, is, is all about. Uh, so I'll be talking about that tonight as well. Um, I think, I'm not sure, we didn't discuss this, Harry and I, but I think people are, we're coming to this, this session with the thought that it would be very easy for me to condemn uh, human rights in Saudi Arabia and, and abuses in Saudi Arabia. My hunch is most of you think that there, 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 there are many, many human rights abuses. Uh, that's not the purpose of this talk. It'd be very easy to go down a list of, of, of things that you and I hold very, very dearly and condemn the Saudis for that. But I think that'd be very, very unfair. I think, you know, we're in an academic community here. We want to try to understand exactly where they're coming from and why they're doing this. They're not some crazy people. There are reasons for all this and some of, some of their views. And I'm not an apologist either for, for, for Saudi practices. What I am, believe it or not, is an international tax lawyer. So if an Arab wants to invest in the United States, I can help him to invest here to buy a building in Carlisle and pay no taxes. Can you imagine? While well, you're paying taxes. Or I can help them set up an international structure to invest in, in the United Kingdom or Australia or Europe and pay no taxes. And believe it or not, most countries, and through the use of tax treaties, and that's what I do for a living. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, Believe it or not, too, is Arabs, well, Arabs don't pay any taxes. They have the zakat, which is a religious tax, but they don't have ta personal taxes. So Arabs will very often go to a large English or American law firm and ask to be represented by a tax lawyer. And that's very, very unusual in, in, in the legal field. In the legal field, uh, many, many clients yeah, American clients, uh, UK clients, European clients will often hook up with, with corporate lawyers, commercial lawyers as we call them in, in, in England. But as a tax lawyer, as an international tax lawyer, Arabs will, will gravitate to a tax lawyer. Now, if you know anything about law firms, the way law firms work is, is it's a business. You know? And when lawyers try, try to tell, talk about, quite frankly, about 
about you know, human rights or saving money, you have to be a little careful because lawyers are trained to make money, really. And, and uh, the Arabs coming in are wanting to save money and not pay any taxes, so they gravitate to tax money. And that's how I gravitated to the Arab world. We have offices, Gibbs and Dunn, we used to have offices in Jeddah, which is in Saudi Arabia, in the western part, near Mecca and Medina, the holy cities. We've had offices in Riyadh, and we have offices presently in Dubai. So I travel extensively there. Uh, you know, we're not going to be talking about Dubai or some of the other countries, but let me just take, take you as an aside. Dubai, you probably all have been reading about it, seeing it on, on TV, and you'll see that Dubai is a very tolerant, very liberal, uh, kind of a no-holds-barred, kind of like Hong Kong is to China, Dubai is to, to Saudi Arabia where all the money is. Now, uh, my friends in Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabists and all the rest of it, and, and you have to, have, to, have to understand this, see Dubai as Sodom and Gomorrah. They see it as, as Sheikh Mohammed, the emir, has sold out to, to the West. He's accepted Western values. There are about 150,000 Emiratis in Dubai, about 1.5 million expats. There's prostitution on the street. There's alcohol on the street. Uh, they're all the things that are, 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 are Saudi, uh, I'm going to call them fundamentalists, but the fundamentalists in my mind are not Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is the radical political stuff, but fundamentalists, religious Saudis, religious Arabs, they like visit, visiting Dubai because of the glitziness and it's what they call as adult Disneyland, which it really is. But it's a, in my mind, it's a soulless country. They've really sold out to the West. And uh, it's not clear to me how that's all going to play out in the future. They're, they're starting to have some economic problems. But to discuss Islam and human rights, um, you have to realize that Dubai is very liberal, very conscious of human rights, have, have, have done all sorts of things in, in ameliorating human rights. Saudi Arabia is, is, is a different, different place. Um, also, another disclaimer, my clients are wealthy, educated, Arab, Saudis. Now, that's very different than the man in the street. I will tell you some things, and, and, and I will say some things to my Arab friends, and they look at me in, with a puzzled look and say, well, Tony, you know, your clients are billionaires. They can pay your legal fees. The man on the street is very, very different. The man on the street is very, very anti-American. We have real problems in that part of the world. Um, now, whether it's the war on terror, President Bush, whether uh, Barack Hussein Obama will change it, we'll see. Uh, the Arabs are very skeptical about, about all of that. They feel that the political system in America will not, will not allow America to look any differently to the Middle East because of its concern about the protection and security of Israel. Uh, so so it, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomena there, and, and, and I, I have to disclaim that fact that I don't talk to the, the man on the street in Saudi Arabia can't afford $1,000 an hour, which is what the legal fees are for a major U.S. or U.K. law firm working in the area. So, so keep that in mind. Now, in examining human rights in Saudi Arabia, you know, one must, must note that the Arabs believe that the West is totally hypocritical, just totally hypocritical. You've seen what President Bush has done with, with Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. Uh, we talk about democracy in this country, and we see what democracy means with lobbyists and money, uh, law firms with lawyers going in and out of government, coming out and influencing government. Um, democracy, very unclear, but they see, they perceive us in the West as being very, very hypocritical about trying to lecture them on what is, what, what is a proper human right and what, what is not, not, what is an abuse of human rights. Now, the two, my thesis for tonight, I've got really two points to make here. One, there's a timeline on many, many things, probably none of you will believe me, 
because there's tremendous prejudice to Saudis and, and, and to the Middle East and, and to, to Muslims. But, you know, for, for a person who's traveled there, who's seen it, there's a timeline. And the timeline, what I mean by that is there are changes going on and major changes in Saudi Arabia as to certain issues. Uh, slavery, for example, was legally outlawed in 1962 in Saudi Arabia. Of course, we had our civil war in 1860 to 1865. Um, uh, women's rights been, are, are changing. Lots of things are changing in Saudi Arabia, but very, very slow. And that's part of the Arab culture as well. Nothing really happens very, very quickly. And, and you know that as a business person, as I'm a business person out there, you don't just expect to go in there get the deal and move out. So, so there, there are changes going on, and they're going slow, but there are changes. And that's also to be contrasted to, to my second thesis, is that when I say Muslims, uh, I'm, again, I want to emphasize I'm talking about Saudis. Islam is not a, a you know, one monotheistic faith that everyone subscribes to. A Muslim in Egypt, a Muslim in Lebanon, a Muslim in, in, in Indonesia, a Muslim in Turkey will have very, very different views than a Wahhabi in Saudi Arabia. And I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, and you have to, I, have to, I have to emphasize that. And, and, but, but most Muslims would say that they have a very, very different value system than is generally followed by the Western world. And they see that their value system is a universal value system, a value system given by God through the Koran. Now, that's hard for us to understand, very, very hard. I mean, we as Christians, I'm a Roman Catholic, you know, we, 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 we talk about the Bible, we talk about, well, that's not really, really, uh, we should not take that literally, we should take that figuratively, well, it really doesn't mean that. These people take it literally the Wahhabists and the Saudis. And that leads to certain views on human rights that are almost uh, uncompromisable because God has told us to do it this way. This is the way it has to be. Some very, very quick points about Saudi Arabia um, because you need to kind of understand that this before you can, you can understand the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was never colonized. It was nothing much to colonize. It was a desert. Uh, most of the Middle East has been colonized by uh, and taken over by Western powers. It's a very, very important thing to keep in mind, and that's why there's, there, there's, there's a certain amount of anti-Westernism. Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy. We don't have absolute monarchies at many places in the world. Uh, the country is named after the, the, the House of Saud, so, so the country is named there. The chance of a constitutional monarchy like that in, uh, in the UK ever occurring in Saudi Arabia is pretty, pretty slim. Uh, but the monarchy is in control. There are about 7,000 princes. Uh, the, the, the family, the House of Saud, cut, c controls the country, and what it says basically go, goes goes on. You have Islam, and you have a brand of Islam there. It's called the Wahhabi, Wahhabism. And these are people who followed a, a, uh, a, an Islamic uh, teacher who, who, uh, who harkened back, it's only a couple of hundred years ago he lived, who harkened back to the beginnings of Islam. Prophet Muhammad, God rest his soul, in 660, those years, that 100 or 200 years there, was what, what the Wahhabis teach as pure Islam. So they're always hearkening back to those times, and they, they try to capture that time. So there's an alliance between the religious people, the Wahhabis, and, and the Saudi royal family. And that occurred with when, so when the Saudi family took over Saudi Arabia, united the different cities in Saudi Arabia, and there's now an alliance between the religious people and, and the political people. In Saudi Arabia, another thing, you have the Mutawa, which is the religious police, 
who are circling around looking for, for women who are not properly dressed, for all sor sorts of things. There was a situation in Jeddah several years ago where there was a fire uh, in, a women's, in a girls' school, and the Matawa didn't allow the fire people, fire people to go into the school because girls would come out and be seen by men. And I mean, it was a terrible thing. And it caused a lot, of, a lot of controversy in Saudi Arabia. But these people are the people who are, are, that, that are hired to keep religious purity going on. There's all sorts of stories in, in, in the Western press that are, are often very, very negative. They, they happen. I mean, there was a story in Riyadh where a, uh, the electricity wasn't working up in the office. A woman employee and a male employee went down to use an internet uh, office there. And since they weren't family members, uh, the woman was put in jail for two or three days. There, have, there are situations like that. So you have the religious police there. Mecca and Medina, the religious cities. Um, the king, King Abdullah, he's the custodian of the holy mosques. So he, he, he puts religion, uh, he supports religion. Religious people support him, so there's, there's this, this alliance. And there's a real fe fear and a real feeling that what happened in Iran with the Shah of Iran when he lost control over the religious people, that the same thing could happen in Saudi Arabia. And I think the, the ruling elite there is making sure that they're always with the religious, religious people. So when human rights comes up, when things come up that could disturb this alliance and allow the religious people or the prince who is very, very Islamic to question the authority of, of, of the royal family, they won't do that. They won't do that. And you'll see in kind of the human rights situations that I come up with. There's a very strong U.S.-Saudi alliance. As much as we love to cut, cut up the Saudis as an American nation, 15 of the hijackers were Saudis. The Saudis are this. The Saudis are that. They discriminate against women. There is a, 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 there's been a serious alliance between the two, the two countries for, for many years, since the 1930s. Aramco, now owned by the Saudis, was there and developed the oil fields in Saudi Arabia. But that alliance is very, very strong and extremely important to, to the United States. You won't find many American politicians talking about it. You won't find very many American politicians saying that the price of oil that's come down to $50 is probably engineered with the help of the Saudis. You won't hear any of that. Why? Because of the political situation in America. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we wouldn't elect a Muslim as president of the United States. That would be a terrible thing, you know. But uh, there's a strong alliance there. We need the oil, and they need our support for security. So there, there is an alliance there. And that alliance is not as strong as it used to be. Uh, the Saudis now can look to China, they can look to India. Uh, U.S. hegemony over the world is over, guys. It's, it's gone. And uh, you think it's, you're going to recapture it. I don't think you are. I think there's a world out there uh, with China, with India, with Europe, uh, with other places that are going to, to, to be counterbalanced with Russia and the U.S. is going to have to understand and how to, ha and, and how to live, a, live in, a, in a world like that. Demographics are very important to understand human rights in Saudi Arabia. 75% of uh, Saudis are under 25 years old. And I'm sure our political scientists can tell us that, that young people are very, very instrumental in revolutions and questioning and wanting to change. And, and, and young Saudis, there's an employment problem in Saudi Arabia. And you'd say, now, how in the world, with a country that was selling oil for $140 a barrel, how could there be an employment situation? Well, one thing is Saudis don't like to work. I mean, they have migrants coming over from Sri Lanka, Pakistan, those countries that do the, I mean, there isn't a Saudi carpenter, I mean, or a plumber, or, I mean, people would laugh at you. Uh, the Saudis 
I got, this is, a, this is a, a vast generalization, but there's a lot of truth, but it's changing, it's changing. The Saudis are the managers. They drink the tea. They tell people to do things, to do, to, to do things. Uh, these young people, though, have been educated in the West, um, and are asking questions. You know, why do I have to dress this way? Why can't I voice some certain political opinions? So demographics are very important. The future in Saudi Arabia, um, a lot of people say, well, they should reform, they should do this, they should do that. Well, that's a difficult thing because big reforms, big changes cause revolutions. And I'm not sure, it's certainly not in the interest, I think, of the royal family to make reforms, uh, radical reforms quickly. I think it's a slow process, and the question will be, be, well, whether even with slow reforms, an absolute monarchy, I mean, I mean, think of it as a political scientist, I mean, absolute monarchy, you know, no dissension, no, no voting, I mean, in the 21st century. Now, just, just, just think about that and think, well, can that last forever? I think everyone would have to say, very unlikely, I mean, as, as the world gets smaller and globalization. Now let's talk about some specifics in human rights, see how we're doing with time. We're okay with time. Um, capital punishment in human rights. Now, all the human rights organizations will tell you that the Saudis have a very uh, poor record in human rights. And they'll often cite first capital punishment. I was in Jeddah a few weeks ago, and I had a driver taking me to, to a, uh, an office meeting. And all of a sudden, there was traffic and people running around. And we're going by a mosque, and there was a, a plaza next to the mosque. And I said to the driver, what's, what, what's going on? What's, why are people rushing around? And there are ambulances there. He said, well, there's going to be a beheading. There's going to be three beheadings today. There's going to cut people's heads off for doing murder or, or something, apostasy or something. Do you want to stop and see it? Because it's a public thing. And I thought just for a moment that I was coming to Carlisle to speak on this and I should go over and look so I can tell you about it. But I certainly, I decided that that's something I couldn't, I couldn't do. The driver explained to me that it no longer is announced because of the human rights outcry from the West. And it will be at 11 o'clock, it's next to the Jafali Mosque, and it's usually on a Thursday. And, you know, there's a segment of people, I mean, in England we had it, in France, that it, they enjoy looking at such a macabre so, sort of thing. And these people were, it was a big deal to, to see that. Now, you have to realize that, that the Koran, talks about capital punishment, talks about different punishments that should be imposed. Now, you go to Egypt, you go to Lebanon, you go to Jordan, you go to a lot of places, they will interpret, reinterpret that, that, you know, that, you know, yes, but this, and yes, but that, but no, but that. Again, I'm talking a very specific country a very specific brand of Islam, not Islam in general. And there is no way, no way, that any human rights organization is going to go to Saudi Arabia and they're going to banish uh, capital punishment. It's a non-starter. And I was talking to one of the princes there and the, was the governor of, of Jeddah, and he looked at me and he said, I can't understand you know, especially from the U.S. I mean, we have capital punishment in some of our states and all that. Again, the hypocrisy of all of it. Europeans have banned it. Um, but, you know, it's the word of God, Tony. The word of God has told us that this is the punishment and this is what we have to do. Now, we're very careful about it. We have maybe 150, 160 beheadings every year. And I said to him, I said, Maji, but as I understand it, again, I'm not an academic, I read some things though, that many of these people are poor people, many of them are Sudanese or Egyptian or not even Saudis, the rich Saudis buy, the, buy their way out and all that. And he says, that's true and all that, but what, tell me about the criminal system in America that, you know, 80% of executions and capital punishments are black people. Tell me about that. Just tell me, explain that. What's that all about? 
So it's not totally clear, but that's something that's not going to change. You might consider it a human rights abuse, but they, don't, they certainly don't. Women. Now, women is an interesting. Women is a, is a timeline thing. Now, everyone here, I'm sure, will have the prejudice of, I mean, how could these women cover themselves? What is this all about? And all that. And it's, you know, it's funny. I certainly started with that prejudice. And, I, and it's still there, but there's a whole thing about it. But it's not so much Islam. It's a cultural thing. You don't see it in most Islamic Arab countries where women necessarily cover themselves. The prophet's wives didn't cover themselves. But there's stuff in the Quran that talks about modesty and all that. And the Wahhabis will get very much into that. And in Saudi Arabia, you wear the niqab, which is basically a mask and two, you know, your eyes, you can see the eyes. Under that is unbelievable designer clothes, Saudi women, makeup like you've never seen makeup before, uh, very attractive women. I can say that because I'm, I, I, I'm very lucky. I'm invited into their homes. That's like to be invited into a Saudi home is like you've made it, you're part of the family. And uh, normally in the homes, women will not come to the rooms where there are men. But if you're kind of part of the family, they'll, they'll, they'll allow that. But um, uh, this is a timeline thing. I, and, and I've seen remarkable changes over the last 30 years. Women are highly educated. Women are now working in offices. They may be separate places in, in those offices. Um, so there's more opportunity for women in hospitals and all that. I think, and, and I, I know a lot of Saudi women, and what's happened is, is, is it's very interesting. Saudi men, again, my clients, the wealthy ones, uh, have the problem the sons grow up and they've had so much wealth that they've never struggled. They've never really, a lot of them fail out of university, a lot of them have fun, because they're wealthy. They don't have to struggle. But the Saudi women, let me tell you, man, they struggle. They're educated, they work hard. I, as a law firm, will hire people from, from my clients every summer. The boys come in, and they work and all that, blah, 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 blah. But they know they're going to go back and they're multi, multi, hundreds of millions of dollars. But the girls, the women come in, hardworking, writing the memos, studying, and all that. And I sit with them. It's difficult for me because they're at the age of my daughter and, and all that. And I say, uh, now, you know, you're, you're, you're educated, you have an MBA and all that, and you're going to go back to Jeddah now. You're going to give all that up. What do you think? And, and, and it's funny. Most of them will say, well, it's changing. It's changing. We, we're doing more things. It's a very, very family-oriented society. There's hypocrisy. There's families that fight. But believe me, they're a society where families are what it's all about. We've lost all that in, in our Western culture. Again, another big generalization. But I come from Italian immigrants where family was very, very important. That changes because the son moves to London, the other, the other son moves to California. Saudis are not like that. I mean, I have situations where I'm doing large deals with Saudis, and I want to talk to the Saudi client, and his daughter it was in a car accident or wants to rent an apartment in Boston. He will stop everything to talk about his daughter and not worry about the transaction. It's very, very family-oriented society. And, and there are all sorts of rules about women and how you take women, take care of your sisters, inheritance, the girls get half of what the boys do. But it's, it's all tied into trust and family and the brothers taking care of sisters. And even the four wives rules where a man can take four wives. It says it in the Quran, it's the word of God. So that's the way it is, guys. Uh, again, is that a human rights abuse if you're one of four women married? Very few Saudis, I only know of one that's been married to four. And it's very easy to get divorced there. You only have to say, I divorced you three times and go to and get a piece of paper. So it's very easy. But um, 
The Quran says you can do this, but you have to treat each one equally. And some of the mullahs will say, well, that's impossible to have more than one wife and treat them all equally, isn't it? Because there's, how can you do that? So there's that, that, that there. And I, but I think the whole women thing, driving, King Abdullah has said women should be able to drive, but we're, our society is not ready. What he's saying is the Matawa, the religious people, are, are, are worried. And you have to realize, when the West pushes a particular point, it gets their backs up, and they're saying, well, with the West, we, we don't want to do it if the West is pushing it. Homophobia, gay people, it's there, but it's all undercover. Quran says you kill people like that. I mean, it's pretty, pretty, pretty hard stuff. Now, again, you go to different Islamic countries, their interpretation of that will be very, very different. But from a Saudi standpoint, if you're openly gay, you've got a serious problem. You're in prison, basically. The Sunni-Shiite divide, and that's an interesting thing, too, because as of up to about six or seven years ago, I always knew that there were differences between Shiites and Sunnis, but I never realized how significant they were. The Sunnis in that part of the world were, you, you know, if you read the academic text, were somewhat uh, discriminatory against the Shiites. In Saudi Arabia, most of the Shiites are in, in the eastern province. And the Shiites are a branch of Islam that, that followed uh, Ali after the pro prophet Muhammad and went off kind of this, di this direction. They believe in Allah, they believe in the basic five tenets of Islam, but they have some, some different rituals. For example, they have self-flagellation, which just drives the Sunnis crazy. Uh, they think that's heretical. Uh, they do a lot of things like they have icons, they have uh, images of, of their imams, which is, which is a mortal sin for a, a, a Sunni. I mean, for example, the Prophet Muhammad cartoons. Again, we can't understand that. Why would somebody want to kill someone for publishing a caricature, because we don't know what Prophet Muhammad looked like, a caricature, a caricature of, of Prophet Muhammad? Hard to understand a culture or religion that goes at it like that. But they're so strong in their religion that, uh, and so f perhaps fanatical from a Western standpoint, that you have that, that situation. Now, you have the Shiites in Iran. You have the Shiites in southern Iraq and Basra and all that. You have the Shiites in, in Syria and part of Jordan. You have King Abdullah of Jordan warning the world that what the United States has done by invading Iraq and allowing Iraq to have a quote-unquote democratic government, which means the Shiites because they're in the majority, that we've put the Shiites on the map. And keep in mind, guys, the Iranians are not Arabs. They're Persians. The Arabs don't like the Iranians. I mean, that's history. And the Shiites are coming in. The Sunnis are very nervous. The Arabs are nervous vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So it's kind of a mess there. And, and, and Bahrain is 85% Shiite with a focus to Iran, 15% Sunni, and the Sunnis run the country. And there's constant demonstrations there and problems. The area is very volatile. Um, the Sunnis, with these bombs, when the Shiites go to Karbala, where the Shiites, uh, their, main, their main temples and shrines are, putting bombs and killing pilgrims, again, again. They do that because, again, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's an interpretation of Islam. Again, I'm not a Muslim, so I really cannot comment on it. But what people say is, is, is if you're an apostate, if you're a Muslim, and you give up to being a Muslim, if you become a Christian, you're supposed, you know, a Muslim can kill you. You're not supposed to do that. I mean, religion is very, very powerful if you're a Wahhabi, for example, or you're an Al-Qaeda type, of, which is basically a Wahhabi our, uh, Muslim. And, and they see the Shiites in that term. And I never realized that until very, very recently. They see the Shiites as worse than Christians. They see the Shiites as worse than her heretics. They saw the light, 
They're apostates. We kill apostates. We kill pilgrims that go to, to, to Karbala. And that's, again, hard for us to understand. But if you're going to work the area and understand the area, you have, you have to understand that. But there are real human rights potential abuses there. Freedom of religion. Now, we as Americans say, my God, why can't you have a Christian church in Saudi Arabia? We have mosques. We have mosques in Carlisle. Do you have mosques in Carlisle? Probably not. But <laughs> anyway, there are mosques everywhere. They see Saudi Arabia as, as the holy land, the land of, of Mecca and Medina. They believe that as a, because it's such a religious place that they can't religiously, mandated by God, allow Christian churches there. So there's some things undercover within the Aramco compounds and all that. But when you go there, you, 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 can't, you can't go to church. So no real freedom of religion there, but there's a reason for it because the Koran basically says that. Migrant workers, uh, migrant rights. Now, in Saudi Arabia, there are millions and millions of workers that pour in from Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, all sorts of places into, into Saudi Arabia. Now, in the old days, you took your passport away, you can't travel. Uh, conditions were not good. My experience, again, not being an academic and not really studying it, but just looking and seeing it, is things are getting much, much better on that score. Certainly in Dubai, it's, it's wonderful. They have air-conditioned accommodations and the whole thing. Uh, but these people are, I think, I think the Saudis have made very, very good strides there. Freedom of speech. I mean, freedom of speech is, is difficult there. And again, you know, in, in the terms of, of religion, there's no, it's difficult to have freedom of speech. For example, you could not have a Christian missionary go to Saudi Arabia and try to preach there. That would be, that, I mean, that would be terrible. I mean, there would be killings all over the place. So that's a no-no. Um, but uh, so freedom of speech, uh, you could never condemn Islam or the Prophet Muhammad and, uh, and all that. So, so you don't really have that. Although the newspapers are now, and the radio and the TV shows, are now actually, there are major changes. They talk about issues that were taboo before. So I see that as a timeline thing, that you know, given some time, that, that that will move forward. Criminal justice, the same thing. The Saudi legal bar has improved tremendously in the last 10 years. Before that, there was very little. There are many, many young Saudis, highly educated, interested in, in the law. So the criminal, criminal justice system is getting getting much better. I think there's fewer and fewer what, what uh, human rights groups would describe as abuses in the criminal justice system. Now you mentioned uh, Clash of Civilizations and Samuel Huntington, and I was going to say something about them too and read, read something very, very quickly. Uh, before I do, a disclaimer, because I mentioned to Mark Rohl, Samuel Huntington's, Huntington's book, Doug Stewart in Bologna, about that book, and also on Sunday night when I was with, with David Cummings and the Israeli professor Isaac uh, Wiseman about the book and how much I, I liked the book. Uh, basic as I remember, Mark, all you guys kind of panned that there were all sorts of problems. And I think there are because he talks about Islam, which is very, very hard because it's very hard to describe Islam. It's, it's an amorphous sort of thing, but very different. But as to Saudi Arabia, I think it comes into it, it's very much, he has a lot to say about it that makes a lot of sense. And these are some, some excerpts that he talks about. He says, you know, some Westerners, including President Clinton and Bush, have argued that the West does not have problems with Islam, but only with violent Islamic extremists. 1,400 years of history demonstrates otherwise, particularly the Muslim concept of Islam as a way of life, transcending and uniting religion and politics versus the Western Christian concept of the separate worlds of God and Caesar. Now, we grew up, at least I grew up in civics class, that it was a given that of separation of church and state. I mean, it's what we're all about here in the United States. You know, tolerant, you can join to a church, 
and the churches and religion, you keep it separately. Now, Islam makes it very clear it's an all-encompassing religion. It's a religion that deals with every moment of the day. They actually pray five times a day. I mean, we laugh probably. You're probably laughing about it. But they're very, very serious about it. Five times. Can you imagine praying five times a day? And thinking, even thinking about God. I mean, how many of us do that? But they do. And they see, and government officials, when they get together, they pray for guidance. When a, there's a football game, Jeddah plays Riyadh. The football players get down and pray to Allah. Now you're saying to yourself, oh, these guys are hypocritical when they go to the West. They, they go and see girls and stuff like that and all that and have a good time. Well, yes, there's, there's some of that. But the core, the core is there. And it's very, very interesting. Men, you see, I mean, my Italian tradition, you go to churches in Italy, you see the old women going there. You see some young people, some young mothers with young children and all that. But the men, they don't have that time. But in Saudi Arabia, the men are all about religion. All about religion. And, and if you're going to deal with them, you have to understand that. Uh, no separation of church and state. Um, now, a further excerpt from Huntington, he says that both are monotheistic religions which see the world in dualistic us and them terms. Both are universal, claim to be the, the one true faith to which all humans can adhere. Both are missionary religions believing that their adher adherents have an obligation to convert non-believers. You have the crusader element in the West. You have the jihadists in the Muslim world. You have big tensions. You have Muslims living in Europe, Muslims living in, in, in the UK where I live for the last 25 years. Uh, people think they're fifth columns. They don't integrate. They don't this. They don't do that. Hard to generalize. But the Muslim faith doesn't contemplate national loyalties. It doesn't contemplate that. It contemplates the caliphate. That, that there's an Islamic world. Uh, and if you really ask a religious Muslim, they will say their loyalties is first to God and Koran. I mean, Americans will say my loyalty is to America, blah, 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 blah. But they don't look at it that way. And that's a problem for a Western country. For people who say they're English citizens or they're French citizens and all the rest of it. Again, this is a generalization. Obviously, there are a lot of a lot of Muslims, a lot of Arabs who don't even think about religion too. But there's there's this element that, that that's there. Now, Huntington goes goes a little further, and he says the underlying problem for the West is not Islamic fundamentalism; it is Islam, a different civilization whose people are convinced of the superiority of their culture. Let's stop there. They believe that they are so superior to us. Culturally, religiously, they believe it. That is a generalization. They see, at, they see the West as secular, unreligious, irreligious, the adjectives are immoral, pornographic, alcohol, arrogant, materialistic, warlike. We're over there in the Middle East. We've colonized their countries. We've, we've subjected them to all this nonsense. They haven't done that to us. We've done it to them. They see us as decadent. They see that their culture will win out, whether it's 10 years from now or 1,000 years from now. They are absolutely convinced that we have, we've, we've, lost, we've lost the thread. We've given up religion in our, in, in our world. And they're also obsessed with in the inferiority of their power. You have to understand that. I mean, they're very much into their history. For seven or 800 years, they were on the top of the world. Uh, they're very, very concerned about their inferiority. They were initially very happy to see the West at its knees uh, because of this economic crisis. Of, $140 a barrel for oil. They saw the Arab world coming back. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's a real concern there. Um, 
He goes on, Huntington, the problem for Islam is not the CIA or the U.S. Department of Defense. What he means by that is every Arab believes in conspiracy, conspiracy theories. Um, 9-11 really didn't happen. It was a CIA plot. 3,000 American Jews uh, didn't report for work on that very day. I mean, there are thousands of Arabs that believe that sort of nonsense. Uh, Oil price, it's being, it's being rigged between the CIA, the Department of Defense. Now, why do they do that? Because the CIA and the Department of Defense have been in the Middle East for years engineering all sorts of things. And it's, they've been screwed, basically, as Arabs. And they have a political system uh, with kings and dictators that are pro-American, pro-West in a political situation. And the man on the street feels he's, he is suffering because of that. And because of that, they, they, they gravitate to the mosque because the mosque was the only institution that provided charitable works and we're, we're good to them. Now, again, Huntington go, goes on. Um, it is the West, a different civilization whose people are convinced of the universality, universality of their culture. We in the West believe that democracy is the only way. Well, define democracy. I think our political scientists would have a real fun day on democracy. We believe that our culture, our notions of human rights, are universal. Capital punishment, women, democracy. But look at the hypocrisy. When Gaza has democratic elections and they vote in Hamas, which is a Sunni outfit, you need to know that. I mean, you need to know that because once you know that, a lot follows from it. Uh, when Algeria votes in a free and democratic election and they vote in, 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 into an Islamic fundamentalist government and the army takes over, look at that. I mean, there's no question in my mind if the West instituted democracy in the Middle East that you wouldn't have Islamic governments all over the place. Now. Uh, and, of course, the West doesn't want that, and the West doesn't want, want to accept that. So this notion that our ideas of human rights, capital punishment, democracy, I mean, President Bush believed, if you believe what President Bush said, that democracy in Iraq and the Middle East would be, is, is what is needed to, to, to solve things. But, but to believe that democracy, certainly an American-style democracy, would do anything on the war of terror to do anything in the Middle East, I think is, was very naive. So, and it also goes on to say, and, and believe, this is the West, and believes that their superior, if declining power, imposes on them the obligation to extend that culture throughout the world. And that's the way the Arabs see it, that we believe that we have an obligation to bring democracy to the world. I mean, they don't see it that way, guys. They just don't see that that way at all. These are the basic ingredients that fuel conflict between Islam and the West. Of course, you have Palestine. We don't have time to get into that. It's almost time up. But two theses, timeline and Islam, how, how, how it affects human rights. Questions? Any questions in the audience? Yes. How do you see the fact that the U.S. is trying to wean itself off Middle Eastern oil as affecting our relationship, especially in terms of human rights? Do you see the fact that the U.S. is maybe going to become less dependent on them? Could that cause them to move more towards our view of rights as they begin to realize that they have less hold over the world because their oil is less needed? Or will that cause them maybe to become more conservative as they face greater financial problems. How do you think that's going to play out? Yeah, for, for human rights. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot, of, a lot of confidence that the U.S. is willing to make the sacrifice to really wean off oil. I, I, I'm an Obama fan. I'm praying that he puts a 50 or 75 cents or a dollar tax on, on gasoline. I'm sure you think I'm crazy, but 
it would, it's what, what we need. We need a little sacrifice. When, when gas is $1.80, $1.90 a gallon, used to be $4 plus, uh, we need to do something about that. We have to ensure that, uh, that Americans don't drive their SUVs. Again, my experience is very different. In Europe, we have public transportation. I mean, you really screwed it up in America with, with no public transportation. I mean, and you're paying the price. And, and, and the price of oil at $50 today, it's not going to be like that forever. This is going to swing back. There's no question in my mind, especially when Americans start driving again. I was just watching TV earlier. They're saying, hey, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up. Gas is $1.80. I know a lot of you guys are driving this weekend. You know, the weather is great. I mean, I thought, whoa, they would never do that in England. They would never say something like that, encouraging people to drive. Uh, so I think Obama has that message. Now, will it affect Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia has more money then it knows what to do. Oil, believe it or not, has been a curse, in my opinion, to Saudi Arabia. What do I mean by that? In the 70s, when the oil price jumped, what did Saudi Arabia do with all those billions of dollars? Again, the alliance with the United States. They bought American military planes. What do you think about that? What a crime. What an absolute crime. Uh, there was graft. There was kickbacks. Uh, princes got paid on, the, on it, and these uh, F-16s were not used for anything. The Saudis weren't going to be able to use their 150 F-16s for anything. So they made a major, major mistake. But it was in the connivance of the United States. Now, I don't think that they're going to make the same mistake again this time when, when oil has gone up. So I guess the answer to your question is I don't think it's going to make much of a difference that even if the price of oil goes down, they have more money than they know what to do with. I think on the human rights issues, I think Saudi Arabia is going to deal with it, and I hope the West and the United States allows it to deal with it in its own time, that it's going to take some time. Certain things the U.S. is going to have to accept or not, because if it doesn't and pushes Saudi Arabia, uh, too far on the human rights, for example, capital punishment, or if, if it pushed on women's rights today, would ca could cause a revolution. Think about it, if, if Saudi Arabia became another Iran, what would happen to the United States? What would happen to the West? So I don't think the price of oil being, I mean, at 50, to, to produce a barrel of oil in Saudi Arabia costs about three or four dollars, okay? So if they get $40, $50, $20, they're still ahead. And Abu Dhabi is the same way. So I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. Another question? Yes. I'm interested in the legal system. I understand it's a Shia system. Do the Sunnis in uh, these countries are subject to Shia law, or do they have a separate legal system? No. I know there's been some trouble in England with Shia law. Apparently, some of the Muslims want to be subject to Shia law rather than English law. Yeah. Well, it's not Shia law. They would, say, they, they, they would talk about it as Islamic law. In England, they have set up, they, they've set up, uh, they're actually uh, what they're called is Islamic courts. And, and, and the Islamic courts are, you can have a Sunni being your, I'm going to use the word judge, arbitrator, or you can have a Shiite, depending on what, what branch of the religion you subscribe to. And what it is, is, is it, from a legal standpoint, the way you should look at it as arbitration. When I write a contract and I say what, what law applies to it, I can say it's not English law, it's arbitration. We'll go to arbitration. We won't go to the courts of England, okay? So what that means is two parties come together and agree that their legal disputes about something, and, and the courts in, in, in England, the Islamic courts, deal with family matters, divorce, inheritance, marriage, uh, children, that's all they deal with, family matters. So if two people agree, and believe it or not, they do, women and men, they agree, and they go to this Islamic court, and the Islamic court decides that there's a divorce, and as long as it doesn't, doesn't impinge upon 
English law principles. For example, if they were deciding about marriages being valid and they said three or four marriages were valid, that'd be a problem because polygamy is, is, is illegal. But if they're deciding, they agree to decide that the son will go to the wife, the daughter will go to the, the husband, all that sort of stuff gets, get, and there's a lot of controversy about that. Britain was, was in the forefront of multiculturalism, that everybody gets along, we love each other, tolerance is, the Brits are, are, are tolerant people, they're wonderful people when it comes to that. But you reach a point with multiculturalism. I mean, the U.S., again, historically, immigrants have become Americans. My Italian parents came over, and we were more American than Americans. I mean, I didn't learn Italian. They wouldn't speak Italian to me. They wanted me to be an American. Uh, It's not that way anymore. I'm probably not here as well with Latinos, maybe. I don't know. But in, 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 in England... It was like a big deal, you know, the Pakistanis dressed the way the Pakistanis would dress and they were English citizens and they wouldn't learn English. And again, all that's changing now because they've really now tightened that up and they don't really subscribe to multiculturalism. Because the truth of the matter is, is again, some of my political scientist friends would, would disagree with me, is, is my reaction is when people are different, I mean radically different, Someone's black and white, somebody is Islamic, somebody's a Christian, somebody's a Paki as opposed to a Brit. It, I don't know, it's in the genes. It's in the genes. We don't like that. We don't like people who are different, you know? We might be tolerant to a certain extent, but when they're really different, there's tension, there's conflict. I don't want my daughter to marry so-and-so, right? And... That's not a good thing, but I don't think you legislate it. I don't think you teach it in school. It's a slow process. It's a slow process. Uh, the Obama election really brought it away. It's interesting in Europe and in, and, in, and in England, interracial marriages, there's absolutely nothing about it. No one bats an eye. It's never, I wasn't raised that way in America. I don't know how America, I've been out, out, I come to America a lot, but I've been out of it for 25 years. But it's probably still an issue, especially as a parent, you know. But in, in, in Europe, it's not an issue whatsoever. And that's the sort of thing that maybe that's a good thing in Europe, because that breaks down these distinctions that we have and the tensions that we cause. cause. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning that you were for human rights, and I think that sentiment is pretty, pretty who can, widespread. Yeah, who can be for it? human rights? I mean, who's for torture and all of that? Yeah. But, um, but then at the end, you also mentioned that we really shouldn't push on these issues too much, and you cited other examples in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and all that. So I guess my question for you would be, what role do you think then should we play, and what is our role in the international community as far as human rights go? Is it just you know, guarding our own human rights, or what do you make of peacekeeping, peacemaking efforts abroad? Well, you know, again, you know, these issues, you cannot see human rights in a vacuum. When the United States has a relationship with one of the most important countries vis-a-vis the United States and the world, Saudi Arabia and oil, you can't say, well, you know, we'll look at it in a vacuum, we don't like capital punishment. Well, the U.S. would have a hard time saying we don't like capital punishment. We don't like the way they're dealing with women and push that to, to, to an extent where its interests, its other interests, whether it's defense, price of oil, uh, the Saudis help us in gathering intelligence vis-a-vis al-Qaeda, uh, the Saudis help us in so many different ways. So I, I would see it as, as really diplomacy the way it should be and it's basically sitting down with them without making a big fuss in newspapers and the media. That would be the most effective way, I think. And I think there's a, there's, there's the, the Saudi, again, I mean, I don't really know them that well, but I mean, I've talked to some of the princes and all, but I get the sense that they're very receptive to that. Uh, but they were really concerned about taking their population, the man on the street, to, to where, where human rights activists 
would like Saudi Arabia to be. And the religious people are a whole different kettle of fish. And the religious people, it's similar to Iran. There are certainly differences, but the idea that if you, if, you, if you get the religious people, the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia upset, that they can't pull what Khomeini did in, in, in Iran, that that couldn't happen. That certainly could happen. And with the United States, I mean, the fact that the United States sent troops to Saudi Arabia caused an outcry, just an outcry. It was, a, it was sacrilege, particularly women soldiers in Saudi Arabia. And this, this is still a problem. For, for the Saudis. So, so I think it's behind the scenes is, is, is the way you do it. You know, you push, but you don't, you gotta be careful. You can't push too hard. That's my feeling. Yes. Uh, you brought up the idea of culture. You know, culture is the reason that the changes are so slow or culture is the reason that women wear the veil. Yeah. But, on the other hand, Paul Farmer says that culture is just an excuse okay. that contributes to structural violence and then allows these violations of fundamental human rights to exist. I guess I was wondering, sort of, what's your take on that? Where do you draw the line? Well, number one, fundamental human rights. I think, I think in defining what those are, I think a Westerner would define that very differently than a... Saudi Arabian Wahhabist, what, what is a fundamental human right? So you start there. That's the first place I, I would have a problem. And the second place is culture being excuse. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, maybe that's right. But you have culture there. You have a history. And I guess what I'm saying is, is um, to change that culture overnight in a society that's been a closed society and a religious society could cause more harm than, than just letting it work itself out over time. Um, I'm surprised, you know, when you talk to Saudi women, you would think that they would be at the vanguard of pushing things, and some of them are, but a lot of them find wearing the headscarf as being a good thing. They see it as being modest. They see, uh, I don't know, it's hard to say, but that's a good point. It, yeah. Uh, that's actually kind of where Tony, we were talking about this morning, but could you comment, what do you make, and what do you hear about King Abdullah's university city, where he's going to you know, start in the university and the schools, where we total mix? Yeah. He's changing yeah. all of this. Yeah. There, there are five economic cities that they want to build in Saudi Arabia. And the one that uh, uh, President Durden is referring to is the one north of, 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 of Jeddah that's called Rabi. And they're going to build uh, universities, housing. They're going to be mega economic cities. And I think Dickinson may be involved or the universities will be involved with that. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. They're, they've been talking about, they've started building. They've been talking about foreign students coming there to study and all that. I mean, it, uh, relaxing lots of the rules. I think it's going to be very difficult for them. Very, very difficult. To, to, well, it's the, it's the Dubai idea. I mean, Dubai has all these different, uh, different concepts, media city and then university city and things like that. It's an attempt to do that, to to modernize the country, to open it up. Um, uh, there's been all sorts of issues already about the construction, about people getting, getting, getting some corruption there and stuff like that. Um, I really, I, I, I think it's gonna be difficult. You know, they've hired some of the big Dubai companies, Amar and Akil, to do it for them. Um, uh, you know, in the past, I would say there's no way they can pull it off. They just don't have that expertise. Uh, and it will open up a Pandora's box, letting Westerners in. I mean, education is going to be a problem for them. It's been a problem already. When you educate young people, they, they want to know why. 
you know, why can't I watch Internet? I mean, satellite dishes are illegal there. Everybody has them. Why can't I vote? Why can't I do this? So it'll be interesting to see whether it works or not. I just don't know if it will work. I'm very skeptical. I'm very skeptical. Yes, from the War College. Taxation. Well, they certainly subscribe to capitalism. I mean, in the sense of, you know, Western. Are you, is that what you're talking about, for example? Or, I mean, they're very capitalistic. As to human rights, I think, you know, there's movement. To, uh, on some of, the, some of these things, but I'm not quite sure I understand what you're... I know that the Islamic thinking about investment are very much guided by their religion. So yes. So there are ways that you can able to see where there's been a bit, some lending or some synergism. Yeah. Yes. For example, Islamic financing is a very, very big thing. Muslims don't believe in, in either receiving interest or paying interest. They don't, they, they, they believe the Quran says that that's, that's haram, that's not allowed. So a whole industry worth trillions of dollars have developed what's known as Islamic banking. We as a law firm do a lot of that. So you structure a deal. A person doesn't put a deposit in the bank. What he does is, is becomes a participant in the bank's profits. There are all sorts of mechanisms to do that. So Islamic banking has become a very, so that's try, trying to be a blend of, of the Western system and the, and the Islamic system. That's a good example there, I think. Yeah. Um, you talked about Islam uh, being a uh, way of life in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Do we have any Muslims? Are you a Muslim? You're a Muslim. So I hope I haven't misrepresented anything. But you're a Muslim. No, you are a Muslim. Yes, you're from Turkey. So I don't know Turkey, so that, that's easy. I can't make a mistake because I haven't said anything. I'm sorry, you go, go to your question. Right, um, Islam is a way of life, and um, the United States or the West um, seems to want to purport uh, democracy and our ideology of um, human rights on a society that is several hundred years behind us. On certain in, things. On certain things in, in their way of, of thinking. How do you think that the United States, or how should the United States and the West better reconcile um, how they've come over a period of time to get to where we are with the changes to help nations like Saudi Arabia who are, are still behind? You talked about the very few you know, elites that are Western educated and is not the majority of the country. And so now you're going to have to deal with that perhaps 80, 85 percent. And they're not exposed yeah. to a lot of what we know and take for granted. Yeah. How do you reach that population and, and get that change? Well, going? See, see, they would see that as very patronizing that you're assuming, you're assuming that the Western view of human rights, the universal human rights, that you have to go out to the Middle East and teach these, these crazy people out there, these Muslims, what, what, is, what is the right thing and all that. I think our friend from Turkey probably could, could, could answer that. And they say that their culture and their religion is strong enough and understands, sure, there's human rights abuses, but, but the abuses are generally from their governments, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, not from their religion. I mean, would you agree, would you agree to that, our friend from Turkey? <laughs> okay. I mean, human rights abuses, in other words, I was saying for us to, I mean, her question implied that we need to teach these people, the man on the street in, in, in the Arab world, in Saudi Arabia, about the understanding of human rights, the universal human rights. I would say, they would say just the opposite. They would say, we don't want your Western notions of what's right and wrong, and what's, what, what, what's right and wrong, and what's, what's a human rights abuse or not. We have our religion. We have the Koran. 
The Quran tells us how to how to I mean tell me, am I is that is that really Well, uh, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting. A country like Turkey is a good example. Without a Turk, it's, they've become a secular country. Uh, they tried to ban women wearing scarves. Now, women start wearing scarves going into the university and all that. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it, how Islam, since the oil, 1973, has now become a major force in, in countries that were very secular. Egypt, with the Muslim Brotherhood, women wearing scarves now, Turkey, places that were very westernized. And now these people are saying, well, wait a second here. These guys came over, took over our country in Egypt and Turkey, and pr tried to tell us what's right and wrong and what's human rights and what's not. There, there is just a groundswell of hearkening back to Islam and their thing. And, and, and it's never going to be, in my opinion, it will never be. How can you reconcile with someone who believes that they're only following the word of God? How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you talk? I had dinner with one of my clients and, and the question of, of Darwinism and evolution uh, came up. And he's a Saudi, and the Saudis believe in Adam and Eve being individuals and that there is no, so, so, no, no idea of evolution. And my wife said to this guy whose name was Osama, and said, Osama, you went to the University of Arizona, you're educated and all that, there is so much evidence that would indicate evolution and Darwinism, there's, there's truth to that and this notion of creationism. And he just looked at my wife and said, Mary, it's in the Quran. We're told this. It is the word of God. There is no discussion. And that's another problem I have with Islam. Again, please, I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, Wahhabists. Not Egyptians, not Turks, not Jordanians. Uh, it's a different story there. Um, and, and, and they say, there is no discussion. These are intelligent people. Uh, and again, we from the West have, I mean, there are a couple, 200, 300 years ago when the West was very much, let's call it religious, and we have the evangelicals today who consider themselves very, you know, interpreting the Bible literally and all that. There's no discussion with people. To a Muslim, to, to a Saudi Muslim, abortion, no discussion. That's no. Forget it. No. 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 Dis you don't demonstrate. You don't discuss. You don't have a town meeting like this to talk about it. You. You know. It, it, you would be killed. I mean, you're going against the religion, and it's hard for us to understand that. It's hard for me to understand that, but that's the way it is. Yeah. Our last question. Last question. Hi. Um, I'm taking an international business law class, and I'd like to ask you a question concerning that. I mean, we all know that with international um, business, it's very risky due to culture, maybe ideals that different countries have, and how it conflicts with each other. And I know that Western countries kind of give preference to maybe developing countries that kind of are going with democratic ideals or lessening their human rights violations. I want to know concerning maybe the United States or other Western countries trading or dealing with the Middle East, are there any preferences with them since culture is so different and human rights violations may still be happening in those countries? Do we still try to work with them to increase or maybe repair our foreign relations or are we kind of a little taken aback and waiting for them to maybe yeah. follow? There's still, definitely there still is. I mean, quite frankly, uh, you know, whether you think it should be right or wrong, human rights are way down the list, way, way down the list. I mean, you know, it's like today with the economic crisis. I mean, environmental moves down the list. All the things that were so important to us all of a sudden become, they're still important, but they're less important. And, and, and human rights will always, well, not all, who knows? Always, again, what do I know about human rights? I mean, I'm just an observer. But 
human rights when you have these major issues. Of, for example, two days ago, the United States announced that it was asking Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Kuwait to put in 100 billion, 130 billion each into the financial system, the IMF, the World Bank, and also in, into the United States, right? Now, uh, that, why, why does it do that? It does that because it's in dire straits because of the economic situation. Contrast that to a year ago when there was congressional bashing against Dubai buying ports in the United States. If you remember the P&O, the Dubai, Dubai situation. Well, they bought ports in England. We didn't have any problem with that. It was great. Employment, all the rest of it. <laughs> Come on in. You can buy up the whole place if you want to. And that's what's happening now. Now we're going to Saudi Arabia. And now we're going to Dubai and the UAE. After bashing them, these Muslims, these Arabs, uh, now we're asking for their money. And that's an interesting thing. Again, the hypocrisy is so incredible. It's like asking, um, you know, the whole thing about whether Obama is a Muslim or not. Let's assume Obama, there was some question about Obama being a Jew. I mean, could we have said to, 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 to Obama in this whole situation that we don't want to be, have a Jew to be president? I mean, there would have been an outcry in America about that. How could you possibly say that? But the people who were with Obama had to say, well, no, no, he's not a Muslim. He's not, a, as opposed to, well, what if he is a Muslim? You know, we've got like five or 10 million Arab Muslims living in this, in this country who are as American as you are and I am, who believe in America and all the rest. I mean, good people and, uh, you know, I mean, we had the issue with John F. Kennedy being a Catholic. How could we have a Catholic run our country? The Pope run the country? My God. Now we have a black, a black president-elect. It's wonderful. But the, the prejudice, the, the, the non-knowledge about Arabs and Muslims in this country is just so incredible that it's going to cause a... It, it has caused, in the Dubai port situation, and will cause the Iraqi war situation, not knowing what we're getting into, it will cause terrible, terrible... Afghanistan with the Taliban. I mean, you know, it's just a whole sort of... And I think what I'm impressed about with Dickinson is now that you have the Middle East studies and all that, that the Middle East studies is very, very important. And someone mentioned that even the War College is now doing more Middle East... Middle East and, and, and we need more and more people to understand. The bottom line is and I know you don't, won't believe me, these people are like you and me. Their first concerns are with their family, education, food, and everything. They're like everybody else. And then you have some, other, some of these other differences. Once you understand that, you realize they're, they're not all terrorists. Is that, is that it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> On behalf of the Clark Forum and College Relations, this plaque is a token of appreciation for your oh, excellent thank you lectures. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This concludes our presentation.